Good job. Praise the Lord. And that's exactly what we're here for, amen? To honor and adore him, but also to be like unto him, where he works in our hearts and transforms our minds and our lives. Elder nomination is that time of the year again. Praise the Lord. Be sure and pick this out of your bulletin. Go ahead and pull it out there now so you can take a quick, pretty look at it. It's nice blue form, all right? There's a couple of scripture passages. I encourage you to take this home. If you get a word from God today, that's fine. If not, take it home, pray over it. Uh, we, our, our elders work in rotation. We have so many men of God in our church. Uh, we try to glean from as many of them as possible in our elders' ministry. So we have a, a rotation period. You're on there for a while, and you rotate it off, and we add some more, and you rotate it off. And so uh, right now, these are the men who are on there from this campus and spring campus, and who'll be rotating off. So it's time to find a couple of men. So I want you to write some names down that you think fit, fits this uh, criteria in Scripture and uh, give us an opportunity. This is the process which we go through as a church to take them. Uh, our elders look over these names, we review, we pray over them as well, start interviewing these different men's names that are on there, find out, uh, starting with the top of the list, uh, who's interested in serving this regard and who's not interested in serving this regard. The Bible says it's a good thing if a man desires this office of, of leadership and oversight. So I believe God does put in a heart of a man a desire to do this, and that's when he ought to do it. It's not a, it's not a passion for, uh, for fame and fortune, obviously, but it's a, it's a place of servanthood and service. So uh, this is a time for you as a body of Christ to step in, do your part, say, I believe brother so-and-so fits this criteria, and pencil or write his name in there and let him know you need to be a member of the church, all right, before you can uh, participate in this. But if you're a member of the church, then be sure and take this form, fill it out when you're done today. If you do it today, you can bring it back next Sunday or Wednesday night. Just fold it up like that, stick it in the offering receptacle, and we'll take care of that. But it is an important time to be praying over it and looking, hearing from the God, see what he says to your heart about it as well. Amen? And don't forget that. Also, one little brief announcement. It is, uh, Tim, I'll remind you at the end, fill the journey card out. If you haven't been to our 101 class, it's this afternoon. We've got four or five that are attending. There's still room for you to get in, but we need to know you're coming. So get that in the offering receptacle as well today. Let's get into our message as we continue our series on God's Glorious Church. The good thing about this God's Glorious Church series is that we're, we're continuing to do it within our Lyft groups on Sunday night. So if you're not in Lyft, great study to jump in on, get into the Word and get a little deeper in the Word of God and see just who we are, what God's called us to be, and really how we function as the body of Christ. If you look in the, the Scripture, we're going to be in Matthew chapter, uh, well, towards the end of Matthew in chapter 28, Verses 16 through 20. In fact, and you get to this passage, we preached out of this before, we looked at it before, we, we got banners that talk about this, we've hung up before, because it's, it's such an important criteria. In fact, these are the last words of Jesus Christ before he ascends unto heaven to his Father. Now, just because they're last words, that ought to be enough of uh, a reason alone to show how crucial they are and how important it is that we do pay attention to what the Lord is saying to us. These are final words. Obviously, we know the passage talks about making disciples of all nations. But as we get into this whole series, I think we need to understand that the underlying purpose for everything that we're doing in this series is to help you understand that when God saves you, He put you into His body, a larger community, a family. It's a new society called the church. And being in that body, all right, being a part of this new community, there are certain responsibilities there, as well as privileges. We have these great privileges of knowing God and fellowshipping with each other and heaven to come. But there are responsibilities that are assigned to us as being a part of this, this fellowship and part of this body. And in Matthew 28, the Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, prior to the ascension, he calls this last meeting with his disciples, and he speaks to them there, and he gives them a very clear declaration. Listen to what it says. We have it on the screen. You can read along your Bible if you like. In fact, keep your Bible open. We'll be coming back to it. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority... And heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, if you look at this passage, and I've said before, and even Tony Evans in his book called The Glorious Church makes reference to this, the fact that, you know, we grew up saying the Pledge of Allegiance in our schools, and, you know, I know a lot has been done by liberal agenda to remove that, 
because it should we have such patriotism and it isolates us from the rest of the world if we you know kind of focus in on who we are and then they try to can't remove the pledge and let's remove the uh, let's remove the, uh, the the part about God in it because we certainly want to do that but most of us and grew up with the pledge of allegiance we said it in schools and public meetings and we just grew up putting our hand over our heart and saying saying the pledge of allegiance I pledge allegiance but uh, you know this for the believer is really our new Pledge of Allegiance. This is really something that you want to place your hand over your heart. You, you could actually say, you know, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to my Lord Jesus. I will go therefore and I will make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that, that we have been commanded. And behold, the Lord Jesus is with us always, even to the end of the age. There is this, because this is what we're here for, Amen. And we really ought to be committing ourselves to it. It ought to be more than just red letters in the Bible verse we may have circled to underline because this is, this is what it really gets to, down to in our walk with Christ. It's, we're not here, we're not islands into ourselves. We, we become part of something much, much larger. We're, we're part of this, this community. It's more than a community. It's really a kingdom. We're part of Christ's church to build the kingdom and we're here for the glory of God. And, you know, and in fact, if you look at this, the Holy Spirit took care of the, the Pledge of Allegiance for all believers when, when we were placed into the body of Christ. Now, we now have this new calling, this new direction, a new motivation, because we're not what we used to be. 1 Corinthians says that we're all part. We've been baptized in the body. By one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether they're slaves or free, whether, and who, no matter who we are, we've all been made to drink of one Spirit. In other words, we're part of one holy body now. And what he's talking about here... I think we're aware of the fact that he's not dealing with water baptism. And I'll talk about that in a moment because it is so important what water baptism is. But he's talking about here our calling as believers, as we've been put into this body, we ought to find out now that as we are part of this body that we've been made a part of by the Holy Spirit, what is our function? How do we function as a group? How do we function as individual members? What are we supposed to do? In fact, the process of discipleship that leads to believers becoming Christ-like is not just for us to make a disciple and to be a disciple. We, in turn, make a disciple, and it's to be repeated. It's the whole idea of it, it's a constant flow of our life, of making disciples. Whether we're doing our pastor's retreat or whether we're doing pastoral leadership conferences or just meeting with our leadership teams or meeting with our leadership meetings that we do and dinners we do, we always get back to this. We're here to make disciples. We're here to make disciples. And, and before you tune this sermon out this morning, you know, please pay attention. This is your life. This is to be your heart. This is to be your understanding. But we don't have this understanding in churches today. One, because we have failed to make disciples. We've made members. All right? We get people and we have attenders. We have pew sitters and warmers and chair warmers, but there's not a lot of disciple making. And, and I, the goal of our church is an individual local church is to make disciples. But somewhere in the context of what the Bible says and where we are in our culture and church building today, we've forgotten this concept of making disciples. We've gone to the new concept, and the new concept is make members, get more people, have a bigger group. Have a, you know, it's bodies and buildings and bucks, you know, the three B's of Baptist, all right? Get more bodies, have more buildings, make more bucks. You know? and, and that's just not the call. The whole church growth movement today has gone into that. How do you get more people in the door? How do you get more people to stay? How do you get more people to pay? Unfortunately, that's where it's all at in the, in, the, in the cultural religious world today. And whole church movements and conferences are built around this of making members. But the idea Jesus says is make disciples. And then in making disciples, you make disciples, and those disciples make disciples, and they make more disciples, and in the meantime, you're still making disciples. That's our heart. That should be the individual heart as well as the heartbeat of the whole church. Now, this is Jesus. He's at his final meeting, and he's articulating very carefully the church's mission. He, he meets them. He tells them to go up to Galilee and there to wait for him on a certain ma mountain. Matthew 28, 16 says, So the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Certain time on Monday mornings, I send out a little mass email as to what time the staff meeting will be. Sometimes it's at 10.15, sometimes it's at 10.40, sometimes it's at 10.50, sometimes at 
10. I don't, but whatever, we, once we got all reports in from everybody, and I've had time to overview everybody's status reports and ministry reports and look at all the things that we're looking at, then I'll go over and I'll put some things together, and we all meet together, and we deal with everything. That's a called meeting. You're going to be there if you work here. Can I get a hearty amen for those who work here? Amen. <laughs> You're going to be there at the meeting. It's a designated time. Jesus is calling a meeting, all right? This is the, the first meeting he's called during his 40 days between the crucifixion and, and the ascension that it, when it, before he goes to the Father. In fact, this called meeting, is, there's several people whom the notice goes out to. Obviously, he's told the disciples, you be there at this place at this time. And they show up. In fact, there's actually three groups at the meeting, uh, including the 11 apostles. Remember, Judas is dead. Second group that, group that Paul called the more than 500 brethren who saw Christ at the same time. First Corinthians talks about that. But the third group at this all-important meeting that Jesus has designated to be there, you know, and to, to be a part of the meeting, uh, is us, really. Those of us who, we're, we're at that meeting in spirit. In fact, so how, do you, how do you know that? Because the Scripture designate that this command was given to be carried out of making disciples to all generations until the end of the age, all right? So since we haven't reached the end of the age, it includes us. It includes me. It includes you. So let's attend the meeting this morning, Jesus' final meeting. We come to the meeting, we sit down, we take our place, we're getting ready to hear the CEO, amen, the commander-in-chief, the Lord of lords and the King of glory. And he says, here's our marching orders, here's what you're to do. Now, if we are genuine, if we're true disciples, if we love Christ, then we're waiting. We want to know what God's will is. We want to know what God wants. And he says, all right, here it is. I want you to go make disciples. Make disciples. Now, before he gets to this part, by the way, let's take notice that he does make a declaration. He shows us that he has the right to execute this kind of mission. His first words in Matthew 28, 18 are, are, are indispensable to the mission, and they are these, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. With no exceptions. With no small print. With no exclusions. Jesus says, I'm in charge of everything. Amen. I'm the top. You want to know where the buck stops? It stops here. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Nobody bigger, nobody more important. There's nobody any higher, nobody any that outranks Jesus. In fact, in heaven or in earth. All authority. In regard to who's in charge, I'm in charge in heaven and earth. It's been designated to me. In other words, I've been given a legitimate authority. It comes from heaven itself. and The authority is in legitimate hands. Jesus says, I have rightful place. Basically, bottom line is, I have a rightful charge to be in charge, and I'm in charge. So now, it's a, it, it covers from in, in heaven, it covers earth, and it covers through all eternity. In fact, you don't believe that, Ten Wednesday night, Brother Tim's doing a great job on the aerial view of Revelation. You read the last book of the Bible, you'll see that Jesus is in charge till the end of the age. He's the Lord of glory, he's the King of kings, in fact, he's in charge of all eternity. So understand, as we've been given this commission to make disciples, it's not coming from, from, from Willie the janitor, or Joe the preacher, all right, or Sam the grocery, or Bob at the, at the gas station. It's coming from Jesus, all right? If it's coming from him, then we ought to pay very careful, close attention. Who's speaking here? The Lord of glory. By the way, if you're a Christian, he's your Lord of glory. So the Lord speaks to us. His authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he begins to, after this declaration, he, he begins to commission us. And he gives a commission to carry out to the end of the age. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. I think the first thing that most Christians don't understand is that our salvation is not the end of it. It's not the be-all, end-all of what God is, is getting ready to do with us or wants to do with us. It's the beginning. This is where God starts. It's not ending. It doesn't end until our life is over and we're in heaven with Jesus. God's got something for us. Getting saved wasn't the end. That's not the goal. We've said it before. It's not God's goal. What Jesus didn't come live the perfect life, die on the cross, be the ultimate sacrifice so that you could come to church, be saved, and get to heaven. That's not it. Jesus Christ came, died, rose, revived, so he'd be Lord over all, and so that he would use us, save us, 
put us back into the culture, put us back into the world, use us for his glory right there, make a difference through our lives to all people around us. But he's got to make a difference in us first, but from that goes out of us into the culture where we're making a difference. So our calling really is not complete until the church and individuals are making disciples who go out and they make more disciples. That's what you've been called to. But no, 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 that, that, that's my responsibility. I thought that was your responsibility, Pastor. It's our responsibility. It's the church's responsibility. Verse 19 is really the core of the commission, and the phrase is to make disciples. In fact, it's a command in the Greek text, and in fact, it's the only command in this text. A lot of people say, well, I'm breaking down. There's four commands here. You go, you make disciples, you baptize, you teach. No, there's really just one commandment here, and the command in the original language is to make disciples. All right? The other three activities, the going, the baptizing, the teaching, they're, they're participles that explain and expand the command to make disciples, all right? That, I make disciples, and part of that making disciples is baptizing them and, and, and teaching them to observe everything the Lord's commanded. And obviously the going, that's all part of it. But the command itself is really to, to make disciples. In fact, the making of disciples is not, even the, is, is not the gospel message. The making of disciples is the command that we've been going. The gospel message is obviously included in that of teaching and, and leading and instructing people. But the, the core of the commission is to make disciples. And the beauty of it is, I've given you the authority. I'm in charge. And now I'm ex extending that authority to you. You go, you make disciples. I mean, that, that, to me it's exciting because it means that he is with us in this process to ensure that what we're doing works right and is right. Great illustration of this making disciples, duplicating the Lord Jesus Christ is, you know, at the service today uh, and... and, and uh, at the end of the service, the video vision team at the back, they will, they will pull out two discs that are back there moving right now. One is recording just an audio recording of the service, a CD, and the other is recording a video of the service so we can use it. We put it out on the web. And we're able to give it to people who are not in the service, who are working in different areas of ministry. We also are able to share them with the community and get outside these circles and put the message on the web where a lot of people can get access to it. So we make a master tape of the service. There's a master video and a master audio. And those, those are taken out of their machines and they're marked as masters, all right? They're taken to the office and then they are duplicated in the office. Now, we used to do this on audio cassette. And for those of you who don't know what an audio cassette is, <laughs> it's like way old school. All right? And it's like there's, it's this little square thing, and it's got a real magnetic tape in it. And as a recorder would head would come on, this tape would pass through there, and it would record the sermon on it, all right? That's an audio cassette tape. Some of you youth are blessed to get your first car to have one still in it. And if you want something to put in there with that, you come see me. I've got some sermons you can listen to. Still on audio cassette tape. We have boxes of them. All right? But now we do something much more technological, and it's much better because the, it, it, it more carefully reproduces in digital format than that old magnetic format. In the digital format, you get a lot clearer, better representation of the real thing. We'll put it like this. Jesus is the master. When you take the master that we make here and we put it in the machine, we have a duplicator back there, all right? It's a tall stack looking, computer looking thing. You punch the first one up and you put the master in the first slot and then under the master are 12 slaves. No, they don't have names. Hooey, Dewey, Louie, whatever, Doc. No. <laughs> now that's an idea. We might give the slaves a name. But right now they're just called slaves. And you know what they do? They don't come up with their own sermon. They don't come up with their own message. They don't come up with their own, nothing. It's all duplicated right down the line. Just whatever went out on the master comes out on the slaves, all right? Now, in fact, the Bible calls us slaves. In reality, the word is doulos in the Greek. They were owned lock, stock, and barrel by Jesus, amen? And what is our responsibility as, as slaves to the, our master is to just duplicate his message, duplicate his life. Being a disciple means I'm becoming like him. My life's being transformed. My mind's being renewed. I'm becoming more like Jesus every day. Now, what is my responsibility as a Christian? Now, listen, it's just to be what God calls me to be, to be like Him, to have His life flow through me. And also, part of that is, I take Him with me. He's in me. He lives through me. And what happens? Other disciples are being made, all right? 
and so that we, we're just duplicating the master. And, and, you know, that's kind of a, a weak illustration, but at the time it's a very profound illustration because, you know, we're not the master. Jesus is the master. He's the only master. He's the Lord of the church, and he's the one whom we are duplicating in our lives. And it's not like we're just doing something as robots and by rote and whatever it might be. No, we're, we're in love with our master. We have a relationship of life with our master. And as he speaks to us, we respond and he's transforming our lives. But this is the idea, and the, the whole concept of commission is, uh, uh, making disciples is that we're just all becoming like Jesus. So me being like Jesus, teaching more people what that means to be like Jesus, seeing them respond and make other disciples in their life, we're all becoming more and more like Christ. That, that's the whole idea, this awesome concept of discipleship. And I, I'm afraid all too often we have become so familiar with just spiritual j jargon in the church and words and phrases, we really forget what an awesome concept and a tremendous concept this whole idea of disciple-making really, really and truly is. Jesus committed his entire ministry, his mission, his entire enterprise to you and to me, the church, has been given this commission. We are the church. So we have this glorious responsibility, and I believe it goes beyond responsibility to this glorious, grand, marvelous privilege to have Christ come alive in us and to get the opportunity to take that to the world around us so that Christ is in other people as well. We've been called to take this to the nations. Every church, if it's being a real church, every local church within our community, our city, our county, our state, our nation, our world, if it's a legitimate church, is impacting the world around them on some level to some degree in making disciples. If they are not, they're not a real church. And the problem is we have a lot of churches that are not. And it's not the goal to make disciples. The goal with many is to make more people, to have more members to get on board. But do you know what? If we just decide to get committed to Christ, and we get decided to commit it to his mission for our life, you know, it is, it, it'll be something that will flow out of our lives as a norm, not something we have to push and press and try to make happen and force ourselves. I believe we fall in love with Christ, allow God to use us the way he wants to use us, and we'll realize that we are Jesus to the world. We're the letter that's being read. We're the book that's being seen. We're the Bible that's being read. Our life reflects Jesus so much that people are attracted to that and then they want to be like him as well. We can change the world around us. You can change the world around you. In the lift tonight, they'll be talking about this. In fact, I'll give a little question that you might want to bring up to your lift leader, see what kind of response you get. Ask him this, how many people does it take to impact and change a nation? How many people does it take to really change the world? How many people does it take to change a city? What would it take to change our community? What would it take to change our culture? That's certainly worth just more than just discussion. It's worth going after it as a goal of your life. In fact, the idea is missed too often, all too often. Discipleship is so big that when we're obedient to God, we choose to become faithful in discipling people, we will impact the world. And I believe this church can, is impacting, but can even have a far greater impact than what even we begin to understand if we would just all realize you and I, young, old, in between, below that, over that, whatever you consider yourself, you're part of this process. No one, none of us are to be left out. Every one of us are to be involved in this whole idea of disciple-making people. That's our call in life. Now, the Greek New Testament word here for disciple, it, it was not <clears throat> uniquely a Christian term. I mean, that didn't happen with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, all right, the idea is obviously unique to him. He created all things and everything comes from him. But the idea is, is that of somebody that's a student or a learner. And, and the practice of making disciples was well known in, in the Greek world hundreds of years before Jesus. In fact, the Greek philosopher Plato developed a system, a platonic system of teaching uh, that bears his name. In fact, he turn, in turn, he began to train, we know these names from history and from school and education, Plato and Aristotle, that he taught Aristotle and his young disciple Aristotle took this platonic uh, philosophy and began to teach and train other disciples. And Aristotle built on Plato's teachings and he developed his own system and it was known as Aristotelian logic, but they'd have these schools. In fact, they, they took their system and made a school out of it known as academies back then. 
and all these academies that Aristotle started were to train disciples to teach them philosophy and the culture. In fact, they became so good at making disciples and producing disciples that when Greek, the Grecian people were finally overthrown by the Romans and the Romans took over, even though they were under the Roman authority and the Romans tried very hard to, the Romans could not eradicate this whole Greek influence of the culture. Rome had the big sword. They welded the power. They wanted to influence their, have the Roman influence on the Grecians. But the Grecians were so well entrenched in their philosophical approach to life and their, their culture that they ultimately impacted the Romans. People who lived under Roman rule were living that way, but their thinking and their mind was more Greek than it was Roman. And, and we discover that in the end, what people think is a lot more important and a lot more powerful than what some external power force can do. And to help us understand why Jesus commissioned the church to make disciples, you can look back at history a little bit and see the impact. And you see, if you can change people's hearts and you can change people's minds, then you can influence a culture. The problem is we've left off disciple making, and in the process of being disciples and being made into disciples, our, our, we get a new worldview. We get a new perspective of the world around us. And what we've done with just making members is we have people who come into the church and they're members, but their perception and their, philo their philosophy and their concepts are still distorted by the world and they don't embrace biblical thinking. They don't embrace Christian thinking. They come to church, they're unchanged, but they go back out in the world and they don't make a difference. It's like Jesus says, salt without savor. Lanterns without oil. Nothing internally happening. Well, when discipleship is done right, a disciple becomes a follower for life. And it really basically reveals the, the, the facts that the real battle is not out here in the world. The real battle is waged in the mind, and the real battle is waged in the heart. And this is exactly what Jesus was teaching. He said, you know, it's out of the abundance of a man's heart. He lives, he speaks, he acts. In other words, how you really believe is how you really act. You see people who, who, who act like the world but say they believe in Jesus but their actions are not changed don't really believe, do they? They're not disciples. They're not following. That's why, especially within the culture we're facing now because of the way the church has behaved itself in the last decade, you got people in their 15, 16, 18, 19, 20s, and 30s that act like the world, and they do church, but yet they go out and they live just like the rest of the world. It's not unusual to see them at the bars. It's not unusual to walk in the restaurant. And they all got margaritas on the table. You know, there's no, there's no you know... You so say, are you preaching against drinking? I don't have to say anything against it. It's all in the Bible. The Bible says you're a fool if, if you're deceived thereby. All right? That one verse was there. But Jesus turned the water into wine. Don't prove your ignorance. Come on, Jesus. Come on. You know? The, the idea is not if something's, if, if God says something against this or that. Or not. The idea is I want my life to be so pleasing to Jesus that if somebody sees me sitting in a restaurant, they're not going to be in doubt I'm a believer. There's not going to be any doubt. Why is it when Jesus said, if you really want to take a vow to live a righteous life, take the Nazarite vow, and part of the Nazarite vow is no alcohol. All right? When the Bible says, let your moderation be known all to man, it doesn't show how much little you can drink. <laughs> I only had one drink at the party. Finished the bottle off and everybody left. <laughs> Tragedy is it, that most people don't know how to exercise moderation. Oh, it's getting real quiet, you know. Why is it going to hurt if I have a little drink here and there? It hurts your thinking. It warps your, it distorts your mind. You know, if you want to find out why the prisons are full, go to drugs and alcohol, and you'll see that 90% of them are in there because of those things. You want to see the weeping mothers of little babies in, in caskets at funerals, go see if some drunk driver went off the road. But I only had a couple. I mean, there's heart, the sorrow and the heartache and the tragedy and the pain alone that comes from it ought to say to Christians, I don't think I need anything to do with that. I just don't need anything to do with that. Well, my preacher drinks. Well, good for him. You know? But I'm not answering to your preacher, and you're not answering to me, ultimately. We answer to God. And I just don't want anything that's going to affect my witness and my testimony and my actions. It didn't take me long to realize that all it takes is one drink to affect your actions. Tell you what, so I'm just going to have one drink. When, w once you drink alcohol, the scientists have made it very clear that the first part of your brain that's affected by alcohol, whether you're taking in cough medicine or taking in liquor, the still the, no matter how it comes into your system, is your thinking. 
So just the, my thinking needs to be warped just a little bit, and guess what? I, well, the second drink sounds okay. I know y'all don't like that. Come on. But you're not going to be able to stand before Jesus and Jesus indict you on something, and you're not going to be able to say, Brother Joe didn't say anything about it. <laughs> Amen. So you love me, all right? But we have a culture. I don't know how I got off on that. Well, that's free, okay? Anyway, we have a culture, and it's not just the alcohol. It's just the behavior. It's just life in general. I mean, you can watch what most people spend their time watching. On, what's your favorite TV program? I mean, you get a real taste of where your spiritual, your spiritual deal is. You're sitting there applauding shows and filled with adultery, homosexuality, fornication. Oh, it's just so great. You know, that's just make me cry. <laughs> you know? Well, what, what have we done? We've let the culture influence us. We've let it influence us. I mean, you read what Paul says. He walked through, through Athens, and he says his spirit was disturbed within him. Disciples get disturbed within by the culture. We say, we want to change. We want, to, we want things to be better than this. We want people to have life. We don't want people's lives wrecked with sorrow and shame. And we want people to enjoy fullness. We want to make a difference in the culture that we're in. We don't want to be absorbed by this culture. And genuine disciples go out and they realize that the real battle is in people's hearts and minds. How do you win that battle? The Bible says that we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we can have the power of God's Holy Spirit in our life and the power of God's Word. And so I apply that to my life. I'm becoming a disciple. I want to be more like Jesus than I am more interested in being popular or getting the pay raise or having people like me. No, I want Christ to like me. Well, he loves me already just like I am. <laughs> I tell you, he loves you just the way you are, but he'd love for you to start acting right. <laughs> I love my children just the way they are, so do you, parents. But you sure wish they'd change some things, don't you? <laughs> change them. Fall in love with Christ. Quit trying to see how close you can get to the edge. It's like the old story Bill Gothard used to share in the seminars. You know, he said the king wanted to hire a driver, and he said, he lined up the drivers for his chariot. He says, how close can you get to the edge of the dangerous cliff without going over? And they're all bragging, well, I can get within a foot. Well, I can get within inches. I can keep that carriage on the road. And one guy says, I don't even go near the edge. He said, you're hired. <laughs> I'm in the carriage. I don't want you near the edge. But we find how close we can get to the edge without falling off. And that's, you've missed the mark. I want to see how close I can get to Jesus. How close can we come to our Father? How much fellowship can we have with Christ? I mean, well, you can get too spiritual. <laughs> you ever heard a banker say that to another banker? Uh, you be careful, you might get too rich. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think so. And most of us aren't in danger of being too spiritual anyway, amen? There's life in Christ Jesus. A trained disciple can live in a hostile critical, dying world without succumbing to that culture. Why? Because our minds are fixed on another world. We're part of another life. We're part of another kingdom and another culture. We become disciples. Then we, in turn, we make other disciples who can be sent out into this satanically controlled world and infiltrate the structure of this world, and we can bring the thinking of Christ and the church and the kingdom to begin to bear on every part of our society. Until ultimately our goal is every nation for Christ. That's what I love about Awanas. And Awanas, you know what that little theme in Awanas is? Every other boy and girl, other boys and girls for Christ. You know? It's every man, every woman, let's reach them for Christ. Win people to Christ. Make disciples. Be the person who makes the difference in your culture instead of trying to be cool and trying to be accepted and trying to be recognized. Well, I don't want people to think I'm strange. You are strange. Yeah. I'm not saying that in a negative way. You are, if you're in Christ, you're strange to the world. I mean, you're different. But that's what gets their attention. That's the advantage we have. Because if we're just like them, well, what do they want? I mean, if we're just like them, we're just, what, what, there's nothing about us that's appealing. But there ought to be something about us that, that's light and that's life and that's appealing and that's life transforming. And Jesus tells us, how do you do this? Well, he says, I want, here's how it works. Go, therefore, make disciples, all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them to observe whatsoever things I've commanded you, even to the end of this age. There's the way it's done. Very simply, I'm not only going to tell you how to do it, I'm going to show you how to do it, and how do you do it? Well, you go. You have to go. 
Now, as I said before, going is not really the command. Make disciples is the command. But, I mean, you can't do that without going. And the going really, you know, is, is, is the fact that that's the journey of life we're on anyway. The first of anything we're going to do here is going, our life, let me put it simply, is that of going. It's not a command again, but it doesn't mean that our going is insignificant. And I really believe that the going is just as you live your life, as you go down this journey, as you follow me, wherever you go, you make disciples. And I really believe that's the content because the idea here is as you go, make disciples. And the idea was the meeting's adjourned. Go make disciples. Wherever you go, make disciples. As long as you live, make disciples. Wherever you're at work, make disciples. When you're at the beach, hey, make some disciples. When, you, when you're on vacation, make a disciple or two. When you're at the grocery store, make disciples. When you're at the gas station, make disciples. When you're at school, at work, play. Hey, I'm on the golf course. It's still all right to make disciples. I'm doing all those things, but in the meantime, my main function in life, your main function as a believer is to make disciples. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, it's going. The second part is help them to identify with Christ. That's the second part is go. The second part is to baptize them, all right? And Jesus said that that part of this whole identification process is it comes real clear when we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Christ. People, once they accept Christ, the gospel is part of the going. We're sharing it. We're living it. We're being it. We're speaking it. As we go, then we baptize them. One of the first things we do after we receive Jesus Christ is baptism. One lady said, well, I was baptized as an infant. Well, you got wet as an infant, but now that you've made a decision to follow Jesus, you can be baptized. In fact, infant baptism was something that was instituted around the 3rd or 4th century where in parents, baby, uh, basically, it was a baby dedication, all right? That was the, the way it really began, and it became, well, to inaugurate you into our particular church. But n- none of that, you know, you have to make a personal decision for Jesus. You don't do that as a baby. Your parents are basically saying, I want my child to follow Christ. We have a baby dedication. We have a time of prayer. We dedicate our children. Really, we dedicate parents and the church to pray for the children and disciple, be committed to discipling them. But ultimately here, the idea is that if somebody comes to Jesus Christ, we want them to identify with Christ and his body. Spiritual baptism took place the moment they said, I do to Jesus. Amen? When they became one in Christ, they were baptized in the body. But this other idea is for identification. I'm identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll have baptism again in a few weeks, most likely. The people who come to know Christ, one of the first things we want them to do is to identify with the body of Christ and with Christ by obeying Christ in this first important decision to follow the Lord in baptism. All right? In fact, the whole idea from where this terminology comes from was it means to dip in something, but the idea was that you're dipping something, you're taking a cloth, and you're changing the identification or the color of that cloth by dipping it into a dye. And it would be taken the dye, rinsed, soaked in the dye, rinsed out in the dye, soaked again, and be pulled up. And the going in was different from what it looked like coming out, all right? It might be green going in, it might be coming out red, whatever. It might be white going in, it may be coming out blue. Whatever the dye was, that whatever was being dipped into that dye would would absorb it so much so that it would now have a new identification. That's what happens when we become one with Christ. We become one in Him. He's in us, we're in Him, and now we have a physical demonstration through physical baptism of what our confession is in Christ, that we have a new life, we have a new direction, we have a new identity. We are one with Jesus. Now, Paul was talking about that in the spiritual sense in Romans when he said, do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we who have been buried with him through baptism into death so that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of his Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. He says, listen, When you got saved, you were placed in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, we read it earlier, baptized into his body. But we're raised to walk this new life, this new identity. Quit seeking to be identified with the world. Quit seeking to have everybody notice and pay attention to you because you had the finest car, the finest clothes, the biggest house, the newest shoes, the latest model, whatever it might be. You're not going to find satisfaction in that. That's a never-ending rat race, all right? As soon as you catch up with the Joneses, they'll buy the next iPhone. <laughs> Amen? Then you've got to get a new one. It's a waste of time to try to keep up with the world. 
Your joy, your grace, your love, your life is going to be found in being identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, one of the first things you need to do is teach them how to be identified with me. And you do that first and foremost by this, this obvious application of baptism. All right? And then you have this new identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, they've given their life to Christ, you baptize them, and now you need to teach them to observe. To observe all that I've commanded you. All that I want, this is the goal of what you're about. Now, of course, what we teach has to be righteous. It has to be biblical content, you know. We want people to be people of the book, people who follow Christ. But the goal is not just information and get content into our brains. Obviously, we teach, why? Teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And now, we're not talking necessarily here about in the ologies and theologies and soteriology and all the spiritual d dimensions of, of theology, you know. But we're, we're teaching them the Word of God and how it's applicable to their life and how it can change their life. So every Sunday, whether it's in lift groups or every Tuesday, whether it's in some ministry or every Thursday night in some ministry or every Wednesday night, we're always teaching the Word of God. It's what transforms our life. Unfortunately, too many people come into churches on Sunday and the Word of God is preached and they're like spiritual bulimics. You know what bulimia is, you know. You know, they go out, they hear the Word, they say, oh, that tastes good. They go home and throw it up. I mean, that's as simple as I can put it. <laughs> they don't absorb it. They don't get it in the digestive tracts, you know. They don't, the Word of God is, is made to be absorbed and, and to be fed upon and then to receive the vital nutrients from, for your spiritual walk and your spiritual life so you can grow in Christ and be what God's called you to be and encourage you to stand up and be what God wants you to be in the world that you live in. The goal of biblical teaching is not just information. The goal is, is that people know how to observe what the Lord has commanded us. It's application. It's the action. How do I carry out what God wants me to do? How do I not be some kind of spiritual bulimic? One of the great illustrations is on this is when, remember when I was teaching on faith a few Sundays back, a couple months ago, and I talked about how, you know, that, uh, that uh, God's always teaching us. One of the instances that we read from briefly was in Mark chapter, I believe it's chapter 8, and Jesus had just fed, I think, 4,000 in that instance, all right? Now, 5,000 fed earlier. And the disciples were seeing this. Remember, he, just, he took a little bit and made a bunch and fed everybody. And the next verse says, and then immediately, after the miracle, immediately Jesus instructed the disciples to get in the boat to go to the other side. And remember, they all got in the boat, and there's a rowing across, catching the wind up and everything. One of the disciples notices that the lunch sack, the basket, doesn't have much bread in it. There's not enough. Now, you talk about somebody that I can relate to. How many times has the Lord kind of said... You missed it. You missed the application. They missed the application. They're sitting there saying, well, I don't think we have enough bread for us to have lunch. And Jesus says, why is it you say among you have no bread? Do you not understand? In other words, there comes an application. That's what Bible teaching is. It's to, to present it to us in such a way that when you walk out these doors, you know how to put that truth to action in your life. You know how to apply it to your life. It's not just some kind of beautiful little sermonizing to get some information up here. No, we have the Word of God which transforms us and makes us new people and gives us everything we need so that when we get out on the streets and now we have to deal with our temptations and our problems or some strong enough, we have an answer. We have a recourse. We have a solution. We have a healing. We have an aid. We have an assistance. We have a miracle. Because we can take the Word of God and apply it to our lives. And that's why, you know, and, and maybe you, you've caught this You've been around here long enough to catch this. How many times have I been teaching on something and you've come up to me and said, that's exactly where I'm at? Or in teaching it, the week later, you come up and you say, I'm sure glad I heard that. Do you not think that God's behind this whole thing called the church? Do you not realize that God is moving in such a way to teach you certain things because He knows what's coming down the pike for you. He knows where you're headed, and He's preparing you all the way. That's why it's best not to sleep, talk, or pass notes in church. Uh -huh. Come on. <laughs> There's a war out there. There's a battle being waged. 
And God is preparing us. And that's the beauty of the Word of God, that we, we are in a church and God has blessed us with a church. Man, we, we are uniquely blessed as a church with to have multiple pastors and multiple teachers and lots of people who are mature in the Word to help us and instruct us. You know, most churches are, if, if the pastor is going to be Sunday, I get calls from pastors. I, I don't have anybody in my church who can preach or anybody can teach me. You got somebody I can, you know. I get that at the time. Can you come up here? Can you me? Excuse me. You hadn't made any disciples? You got no disciples? What a tragedy. Praise God. We got some disciples. Amen. That's a hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And they're not boring. <laughs> I had a Sunday school teacher that was like that. I know we all have had that entire times. You, know, you think, oh, when is this going to be over? <laughs> I've been drugged to the sand, you know. <laughs> God's blessed us. Amen. Because we have disciples in our church, and those disciples are in turn, they're making other disciples, and God's doing a great work in the process. But that's the process of making disciples. But as he closes there, he's told us how we do it. We go, we baptize, we teach them how to observe, we give them content and application, and then he promised us his presence. And he closes the Great Commission. And this is a tremendous blessing, a promise that the Lord says, you know, it's, it's, and it's made even stronger. He says, lo, I'm with you always unto the ends of the earth. And sometimes because uh, uh, we miss the, what the, the low, in fact, the more accurate translation, King James says, lo, I'm with you always. And we say, lo, well, that just means stay off airplanes, you know. And low with me. I told somebody, I'm a scuba diver. That means go scuba diving. Low, I'm with you. The deeper you get down the water, the, the more he's with me. Amen. So low, low, I'm, no. The low, don't miss what the low is. I mean, in the go, if you miss the low, you might not know what you're about doing. All right? So don't miss the low. The low, and some of the modern translations read it more like this. Uh, uh, when they translate the low, it says, it's, it's low. It's I, even I, I myself. Because you see, low is, is, is actually another form of the first person pronoun. It's not an adjective or an adverb added to something, you know. It's, it's, it's another pronoun for like he, she, I, me. So he's saying, it's kind of like he said, verily, verily, you know, truthfully, truthfully. In other words, boy, you, you get a verily, verily, better pay extra, extra attention. <laughs> but he said, low, I, even I. Well, you're just, the, aren't, aren't, I don't know if you can be with me because it's like saying I need the president's assistance. I ain't never going to get into the White House. They're not going to let me in. You know, I said, I'd like, to, I'd like to meet with President Obama. They said, well, who are you? Oh, well, I'm Pastor Joe Arms. Well, bless your heart. We don't have any time today. <laughs> but guess what? Lo, I, even I, Jesus, says Jesus, even Jesus will be with you. Now, before you walk out here and say, oh, the Lord's with me always, what do we always say in Bible teaching? Context, context, context. Lo, I, even I, am with you while you're making disciples. Now, I know the Lord's presence is on my life. He's committed to me. But I think he's saying here, if you want to see the demonstration of the grace and the power and the strength that you need to make disciples, it's going to come from me. You go, I'll be there. That's powerful to me. Remember, get back to context. So, well, I just have the Lord's presence everywhere I go. Well, I'm sure you do. But if you really want to see a manifestation of it in power and grace, be a disciple that makes disciples. Be a disciple that makes a difference. Be that person in life who says, I'm not going to try to say how much of the world I can absorb and be like the world and, and see it, you know, kind of excuse and justify things in my life. You know, this is okay, that's okay, this is okay. What a waste of your spiritual life and your spiritual energies. In fact, you know, it's not a matter of what's good, what's bad. It's a matter of how much of Jesus can I manifest in my life? How much of Jesus can be alive in me? How much authority can I walk in? How much power can I experience in my life for his glory today? How much can I be like Christ today? What is there about my life that's, that's just absolutely, there's no question about when people see it in my life, that's Jesus. And what is it in my life when people look at it and say, that ain't Christ. Those are the things we deal with, amen? It's like the sculptor. You've heard the story about the famous sculptor, you know, he's, he's, he's knocking out the the horses, the, the statue out of the rock, and it comes out to be a beautiful stallion with mane flying in the hair and paws lifted up and looks like the thing. It's, it's made out of stone, but it looks like getting ready to charge off the blocks. They say, how do you do that? He said, well, I just knock off everything that doesn't look like a horse. <laughs> you know? I think in our life we have to go, I just need to knock off everything that doesn't look like Jesus. Yeah. You know, I just need to get rid of it. I, there's just too much good. Be worried. Be, you know, it's like be digging over here in the dumpster. You know, when God says, you can be eating at my table, which one do we want? Well, everybody's at the dumpster. I'm going to the dumpster, but not to eat. 
<laughs> and not to find life. I'm going there to make disciples. That's my journey to the dumpster, and that's your journey to the dumpster. You know, it's, it is a glorious thing. This promise is so incredible. And God says, I am and I'll be there when you're doing this. I guess the question would be for ourselves, if I'm not seeing that kind of authority on my life, and I'm not seeing that kind of power on my life, I'm not seeing the presence of Jesus on my life, that, you know, I'm not seeing it in my church, I'm not seeing it in my life, why not? Everything you need, God has provided. By simply telling you, I'm there. Would we realize his presence and get in on what God's doing? This is nothing new for anybody that's been a member of this church for any length of time, is it? But because of the nature of the beast, so to say, of our lives, it is certainly something we must always be reminded of. But I do not want you to get it out of the prime perspective, the prime place. This is what Jesus says is our purpose. What's your purpose? Well, my purpose is to make more money. My purpose is to be number one. My purpose is to be the prettiest. My purpose, we have all these things, and we forget the prime directive, so to say, for the believer, to make disciples. Can't do that unless you're being one. But if you are one, then you have everything you need to be what God's called you to be. Lay aside the sin that so easily besets us, Scripture says. Lay aside the things that so easily beset us, and let's pursue Jesus, and let's pursue Christ. There's nothing in this world that's worth arguing over in the context, well, I need this, I've got to have this. It's just not, it's irrelevant in eternity. One thing I desire more than anything else for your life or for my life is this little principle here. We preach it constantly. We present it constantly. We talk about it constantly. We, we, we deal with issues of it constantly. Make disciples, make disciples, make disciples, make disciples, make disciples. If you haven't got that in the years that you've been here, then either you're hard of hearing or I just don't know how to preach. And it may be both. I don't know. But in case neither one has understood it, Make disciples. So what, God, what has God called the church to do? Make what has God called Believer's Fellowship to do? Make what has God called me to do? Make What's God called you to do? Make All of us working together. What a beautiful plan. More and more people come into the family of God. That's where you're going to find your greatest joys and your greatest blessings, being what God's called you to be. Hallelujah. Amen. Be a student. Be a learner. Be a follower. Be a doer of the Word of God. Would you stand with your heads bowed?